Embassy Federal Credit Union. like a lamb thrown amongst the wolves. She wasn't used to being out there on the streets and stuff like that. Tonight, we're hearing from the family of a homeless, mentally ill woman who was brutally beaten to death in an unsolved homicide. Ella Crawley died last May following a violent attack in Winston-Salem. And tonight, one year later, police are still searching for her killer. Hello and welcome. I'm Michael Hennessy. And I'm Katie Nordine. Ella's sister and brother-in-law spoke with Fox 8's Allison Smith. Allison, they say she was especially vulnerable to the streets. Katie, our family says she struggled with mental illness and stopped taking her medication. And this is Ella right here to my left. So they say that she would wander into bad areas unaware she was putting herself in danger. A stranger found Ella in grave need of medical care near a walking path in Gateway Commons Park in May 2020. Police say she was beaten and strangled by her attacker and died the following day from her injuries. Now, shortly after her murder, officers canvassed neighborhoods close by on West Northwest Boulevard for information. And since then, police have really struggled to develop leads. Ella's family says she was experiencing homelessness when she was attacked before going off her medication. The 50 year old was a frequent churchgoer with incredible wit and charm. Ella's family is hoping and praying the Lord will provide a clue to help police track down her killer. So why somebody would want to beat her up and, you know, attack her like that, you know, was beyond me. It was just beyond me. How and, and, and why? why? Why would someone become that enraged at this little this little lady that you, you could visibly see um, was not OK? All right, Melissa says her sister couldn't have weighed more than 80 pounds and would not harm anyone. Winston-Salem police, they say the case is growing colder and they need the community's help to continue pursuing leads and bring Ella's killer to justice. Katie. Allison, thank you. Let's hope they get some answers soon. Well, Reedsville police are looking for the people who fired a dozen bullets in a neighborhood Saturday afternoon, one of which hit a five-year-old girl and sent her to the hospital. The shooting happened around 240 on Northwest Market Street. The family of the young girl told Fox 8 she was in the front yard playing with her cousins. Down their block, a person began to fire several shots at an unknown target. The bullet hit the five year old just above her left shoulder. One of the neighbors who lives a few houses down told Fox 8 it sounded like a series of small explosions. We thought the guy across the street was shooting fireworks off. My wife did, but she looked at the window. And my daughter said, don't, Mom, don't go out there because that ain't no fireworks. Somebody shoot. Man. And so after it all went over with, we come out here and we heard some more shooting. So me and her both went back in the house. I was trying to get back in the house, too, because I said, that bullet don't have no eyes on it. So. And the family of the child tells us she is doing okay, but is still in the hospital. Police are getting several Crime Stoppers calls in on this case and are following up on every single lead. They ask anyone who knows anything about what happened on Northwest Market Street to call them. In terms of the weather, it was a perfect day outside to remember our fallen service members on this Memorial Day with clear conditions across the Piedmont. And it's a pretty clear night, but a change is on the way with warmer temperatures and some rain. Fox 8 Max Weather meteorologist Charles Hewing here with more. Charles, a lot of people were asking for that rain last week. Sounds like they're going to get it this week. No, oh, yeah, they sure are, Michael. In fact, our rainfall for pretty much for the month of May, just very inconsistent. Heavy rain, then stretches of nothing, then heavy rain, then nothing once again. Now check this out. From now till about Wednesday, it trace to maybe a tenth of an inch of rain. Then by Sunday night, the rain is really going to pile up one to maybe as much as two inches of rainfall. 
will be possible. So yeah, the wet times are coming up. But for now, today's high did make it up into the low to middle 70s across the area. Very nice Memorial Day Monday for us. Now for tonight, our numbers will slip back into the 50s. That's a lot better than earlier. First thing this morning, we had numbers in the 40s for some locations. So going back into the low to middle 50s, not a bad idea. But like I said, big changes are on the way. The rain is coming in and we'll break it down and time out this map for you coming up soon. Tonight, family and friends honoring who they call the ambassador of Winston Salem. Tior Terry died on February 14th, Valentine's Day, with police responding to a call of a man lying face down in a parking lot after being shot. And tonight, friends and family remembered him in a place he knew and loved oh so well. Fox 8's Daryl Matthews has the story. And unveiling everything that um, um, who he is. Um, my son was bigger than life. Honoring a longtime employee at the CVS on West 4th Street in Winston-Salem. So the color palette is, is a mixture of red and yellow and very bright, um, you know, strong colors like Tior was. Family and friends say this picture showcases Tior's infectious smile. His face, that, that facial expression, they gave him catch. That is it right there. Um, he would have loved it. His mother, Velma, seen the impact her son had on this city. It, it means love. Um, it means community. Um, it means that my son um, did serve his purpose. He did um, what he was supposed to have done. He served. T.R. Terry died on February 14th after officers found him lying face down in a parking lot suffering from a gunshot wound. What, ha what happened from, from there is when I learned that I, I had lost my friend, I didn't know how to make sense of it all. So I decided to make art. And she did by making this 50 by 40 canvas painting of a dear friend. They just run into him once or twice and he made them feel incredibly welcome. And to me, he was the ambassador of downtown Winston-Salem. It means for me to just know that so many people cared about him. And that's all, that's, that's enough for me to know that I can go somewhere and actually, you know, see my cousin and have, you know, continue to have memories, good memories of him. A lasting image of a soul near and dear to his community. As long as you're a good person on this planet, and when you're gone off this planet, you'll remain a good person. Your spirit will live on forever. And that's what I want them to think when they walk past here, that your spirit will live forever. I can tell you, having worked in Winston-Salem for five years and going to that CVS, I definitely remember his smile. He also worked at another CVS for several years. His murder still under investigation. A rallies against the deputy-involved shooting of Andrew Brown Jr. are planned all around the state tomorrow. They are scheduled to begin at 5 p.m. in several major cities, including Winston-Salem and Greensboro. But people have been out marching every night in Elizabeth City where this shooting happened. Protesters say Brown was unjustly killed, but a prosecutor cleared the deputies of any wrongdoing, saying Brown used his vehicle as a weapon. And a voice for their loved ones. For some Triad Gold Star families, Memorial Day means honoring fallen service members at events or reflecting at home. Uh, parents Sam and Evelyn Harris lost their son in 2008. Petty Officer First Class SEAL Joshua Harris died leading a combat mission on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. After he passed away, they learned their son received several bronze hearts and other awards. They've hung them on the walls of their home next to his artwork. And Sam Harris says it's been 12 years, but it feels like yesterday that he was notified of his son's death. And he remembers him as a driven man with a big heart. He was the kind of guy that you really wanted to have some similarities so that you could be his friend. And that's the way he was. He just drew friends. The family holds an annual charity golf tournament in Pinehurst in Josh's name. The events raised more than a million dollars for various organizations. 
And it's been a hundred years since the Tulsa race massacre in what was known as Black Wall Street. And just ahead, we're getting a closer look at what this area meant to the black community and what happened on this day a century ago. And a high school principal's graduation speech gets him escorted off campus. What he said that some found so controversial. And tonight we want to say a special congratulations to all of the graduating seniors across the Piedmont Triad. Best wishes to all of you. Today marks a hundred years since the Tulsa race massacre. It's one of the worst incidents of racial violence in our country's history. Dozens of people killed after a white mob attacked what was once known as Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And tonight we're getting a closer look at what Black Wall Street, also known as the Greenwood community, meant to the black community in Tulsa and how everything unfolded on this day back in 1921. Donna Terrell spoke to people who explained the history behind that area. Tulsa, Oklahoma, a city diverse in its people and culture fueled by a complicated past, some of which involves the historic Greenwood District, better known as Black Wall Street, a community of prominence and wealth for black people in the early 1900s. You could go down to the Green Greenwood Avenue, which is really the hub of, of what was called Black Wall Street, and find um, restaurants and grocery stores and movie theaters and taxi cabs and haberdasheries and furriers, but also doctors, lawyers, um, pharmacists, dentists. Many of the people who came to Indian Territory, Tulsa, the Greenwood, Black Wall, what we know as also Black Wall Street, had received their educations back, uh, particularly in the East, at. Uh, Morehouse and Spelman and Howard University. So they were professional people with 
professional skills. Black Wall Street's founding father, Ottawa Gurley from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, arrived in Tulsa in 1906. He came here already having wealth. He opened a grocery store and bought and sold land to other black people. Businessman Simon Barry ran a taxi and bus service and owned a chartered plane company catering to rich oil men. It was said that each dollar changed hands 19 times before it left the community. Black people living the American dream, but a volatile situation loomed. This was a really dark time. This is a period during which events that were called race riots were happening all throughout the United States. Greenwood, a fertile field for tension between blacks and whites. If one embraces this notion of white supremacy, and one can look across the railroad tracks and see a very successful black community with people owning homes, driving cars, wearing nice clothes. If you're a white person and, and you're not doing well economically, then something is amiss. The ship has to be essentially righted. The Trigger, an encounter in the Drexel Building elevator in downtown Tulsa between teenagers Dick Rowland, a black shoeshine boy, and Sarah Page, a white elevator operator. Something happened that we don't know exactly what. Page said she was assaulted, though she later recanted, but a local newspaper embellished the story, adding fuel to the fire. Out of fear, Rowland would be lynched. Armed black men came to the jail to protect him. They were met by a larger group of armed white men. Then, a gunshot. And as one of the massacre survivors says, all hell broke loose after that. An angry white mob set Greenwood on fire. The entire community burned, totaling 35 city blocks. The popular Dreamland Theater gone. More than 1,200 homes, 600 businesses, and the famed Wall Street left in ruins, as were a number of churches. And all this happened in only 18 hours. Reverend Robert Turner pastors historic Vernon AME Church, where only the basement survived the massacre. It was the first time airplanes were used to terrorize Americans. Not 9-11, not Pearl Harbor, but right here in, in Greenwood, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's estimated between 100 and 300 people, mostly blacks, were killed and many others wounded. Some of the survivors, including Gurley, left and never returned. After the massacre, the people who stayed here rebuilt Greenwood. In fact, in the 1940s, it thrived with well over 200 documented black businesses. Ironically, it was integration that led to the demise. When integration comes along and black people are able to spend outside the community, they're able to access more goods and services at better price points, it undermines the financial foundation of the community. Another blow, urban renewal in the 60s, where the city would buy up or condemn some homes and businesses. It also brought Interstate 244, which barrels right through the heart of Greenwood and had really a devastating impact. Today, there are some businesses on Greenwood Avenue, but Vernon AME Church is the only property still entirely black owned. A ballpark in Oklahoma State University, Tulsa, occupy a huge chunk of land where homes once stood. But the community's rich history teaches us many lessons, including the power of the human spirit and the notion that some history bears not repeating. You know, I typically would, would paraphrase something that Dr. Maya Angelou said that I think is both simple and profound. She said, our history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, it need not be lived again. Well, parents receive a pretty scary phone call from someone claiming to be their daughter saying she had been kidnapped and they needed to pay money for her release. It was a scam and we've heard these stories before, but it's how they think this scammer was able to get their daughter's information and voice that is so eye opening. An exotic reptiles found in a North Carolina park and no, they weren't born there. Why pet shop owners say they're seeing more of this kind of reptile being released and it's not only wrong, it's dangerous.
Tonight, there are yet to be any arrests made in a deadly banquet hall shooting in Florida that left two dead and more than 20 injured. Investigators say this shooting was the result of an ongoing rivalry between two gangs. And today, Miami-Dade police released new surveillance video of three suspects. You're watching it here. Shows three men getting out of a white Nissan Pathfinder, rushing off camera, then later running back to that SUV, and then they take off from that scene as you just watched. It happened just before midnight Saturday at a party at Hilea, Florida, and dozens of people were gathered outside the venue when those three gunmen in ski masks and hoodies jumped out of that SUV, started shooting randomly into the crowd. A $130,000 rewards being offered for any information that leads to arrests. Well, recovery efforts continued today following the crash of a small jet into a lake. Seven people were on board that plane when it crashed into the lake in Rutherford County, Tennessee on Saturday, and all of the people are presumed dead. Experts say the plane, a Cessna C-501, is very safe, and officials are looking into every possibility as to why it could have crashed. A preliminary report about the crash won't be released for at least a week or longer, and officials say it could be two years until the full investigation is complete. Recovery teams have already pulled out pieces of the plane and some human remains. All of the passengers were members of the Remnant Fellowship Church of Brentwood, including its founder. Well, two parents get a call from someone claiming to have kidnapped their daughter, and they even hear her voice on the other end. And the parents, who are from Florida, rush to the bank to send ransom money, but just moments before doing so, they realize the whole thing was a scam. And Christine McClarty tells us how they discovered their daughter was actually safe and sound. The couple reported the incident to Pinellas Park Police. Now, in an effort to help others, they're sharing their story with Eight on Your Side. We hear the screams of our daughter. Uh, asking for help. And uh, my heart almost stopped, but then I had to act quick. Jane and Joe say their nightmare became a reality. In an effort to conceal their identities, Eight on Your Side changed their voices and are referring to them by alias names. They say at 2 p.m. Wednesday, they thought their daughter was at Morgan Fitzgerald Middle School in her eighth grade class until they got a call saying she was taken, telling the parents to send money or else. If you call police, uh, uh, he said, I'm going to rape your daughter and I'm going to kill her and you're going to be attending a funeral. Then they heard their daughter's voice. She said, uh, Mom, please come. Uh, he's going to hurt me if you don't. Panic setting in. Well, your pulse is probably over 200. Your blood is rushing to your head and you're not quite thinking straight. The couple has two older sons. The 14 year old girl is their baby rushing to the bank to transfer $2,000 to save her. The whole time Jane worried about her daughter's well-being and her husband's. He may be sick and he may get a heart attack. He may get a stroke at that moment and you never know. Moments before sending the money, Jane called police from a different phone. A school resource officer determined their daughter was in class and was safe. I never called her, and I think that was my biggest mistake. So if parents listen to me, <laughs> always call, call your child. They think her voice was stolen from a social media account or the Internet. Hopefully she learned not to record her voice, if she did, ever did. Um, me as um, not to answer unknown calls. Pinellas Park Police weren't available to speak with us Friday. Now the parents hope police can track down the man on the other end of the phone so no one else has to go through this experience. They tell us the whole ordeal lasted about 20 minutes. Still ahead, graduation speech controversy. What a principal said at the podium that ended with him being escorted off campus. And our holiday is coming to an end, so it's time to go back to work and back to school at the bus stop on your Tuesday morning. Partly cloudy skies, maybe a light jacket with a temperature of 60 at 8 o'clock. Stay with us. I'll let you know when you have to bring the umbrellas with you. Stay with us.
Um. A musician using his talents this Memorial Day to remember the people who sacrificed their lives for this country. Matt Cribbs, who lives in Charlotte, went outside today to play taps on his trumpet. It's part of a movement called Taps Across America. It started last year when people couldn't get together for Memorial Day. Musicians across the country stepped outside at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and played. And he doesn't personally know anyone who died in the service, but says he's not doing it for himself. I can share that and it, you know, brings some peace or comfort or just some time of remembrance for somebody, then that's, that's, that's a great job. My, my part's done. It's my, just, just my duty to do what I can. And this year, his neighbors were waiting and watched him perform. And Crib says he's changed a lot in the past year and being able to connect with people this way is more important to him than ever before. A mother and her two children make a pretty surprising discovery while walking at a Charlotte park. They found an iguana. The owners of cold blooded and bizarre say it was clearly abandoned by its owner. They say after seeing an increase in sales, they have also received 337 rescue calls last year. That is compared to 122 pre pandemic. They say people come in and drop the pets off because they can no longer take care of them or they are found abandoned in local parks. They were going for a walk in the park and they saw this lizard. They thought it was dead. They got closer to it. It started moving a little bit, so they brought it to us. Instead of taking him to the exotic vet and incurring a bunch of vet bills, owners probably just dumped him in the park. The store owners say the iguana had severe burns and eventually had to lose its two front feet. They say it is in good shape now and will stay at the store. Well, principal's time at the podium for his graduation speech ends up with him being escorted off campus. Yeah, this happened in Stockton, California last week. Since then, video of this speech has gone viral. Some say they felt he made the day all about himself. Jonathan Tarea shares more about what he said. A long chapter coming to an end. Today was about celebrating the students. Stockton Stagg High School class of 2021 graduates were able to get an in-person ceremony, but not without a controversy. Unfortunately, Mr. Nakamura took it upon himself to use this platform for his own grievances. Stockton Unified School District spokesperson talking about Principal Ben Nakamura. She says he was escorted off campus after his early morning graduation speech. He was escorted to his car and he did turn in his keys. In a video circulating on social media. That's why I came here. And why I only lasted one year. Principal Nakamura tells the graduates to study hard and do their best. He also touched on his personal experience of losing his mother to a heroin overdose, violence in neighborhoods, race, and helping the next generation. He said such things as successful people only get that way by stomping on each other. We got numerous calls from parents complaining, saying that the principal was using the graduation as a platform to share his own grievances. So they asked Nakamura not to attend the noon and 3 p.m ceremonies. Anger, shock, sadness. Sophia Clone, who has kids in the district, says Nakamura is loved by his students and she can't believe what happened. That speech tells me how honest this principal is with his students. Tell the students, be a mentor to your little brothers and your sisters. He told us where he came from, how relatable, how vulnerable. That was my takeaway. Don't be a sellout. Tell the truth. All right, folks, check it out. Is this how you enjoyed your Memorial Day Monday? Just hanging out at the lake, whether it's High Rock Lake or perhaps Oak Hollow, just a good time to be out and about. Or maybe you're at some of the many events honoring our folks that failed defending America. Just very nice day all across our area. Mainly sunny skies for the latter half of our day that allow for our numbers to jump up to around 74 degrees this morning. Very cool at 51 right now is sitting at 64 degrees. Other numbers out there 
mainly in the 50s and 60s, already cooling back to around 56 up there, Rockingham County, Greensboro High Point, Winston-Salem, now coming in at 64 degrees. So look for clear skies for tonight, but by the time you wake up on your Tuesday morning, look for a few clouds rolling across our skies. And then by Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday evening, let's call it partly cloudy, and it will be a warmer day for our Tuesday. So let's go ahead and put everything all together here. High pressure controlling our weather now. This will begin to slowly pull away as it moves away. Our winds will turn around into the south. That will help to warm things up for our Tuesday. Also at the same time, we will begin watching this warm front to our south lifting northbound. With that warm front, yeah, we got some muggy air coming in right behind it. And as this warm front moves through our area during the day on our Wednesday, Roughly about a 20 to a 30% chance for a scattered shower or thunderstorm, but really this will just set the stage for some pretty good rain that will be in the forecast for our Thursday and Friday. Our extended forecast, you see it here, a whole lot of green for Thursday and Friday right now for Saturday. It looks like this is trending more toward the east. If this pattern continues, I will go ahead and lower our rain chances for our Saturday. But for now, I'm going to hold it at 40% just in case some of this rainfall tends to linger over our area on our Saturday. Now in terms of our rainfall, it's really going to pile up Wednesday, not so much Thursday and Friday. I think those two days could be very wet for us. Then by the time we get to the end of the forecast around Sunday night, some folks could have one to two inches of rainfall in their rain gauges. So we are coming up for some soggy weather as we make that transition from May over to June. So we'll see if this pattern holds for the remainder of June. But for now, anyway, we're just talking about some dry conditions going down to about 54 degrees and looking ahead into our Tuesday time period, sunny in the morning, partly cloudy by the afternoon with a high temperature of 80 degrees. That's a tad bit warmer than what we had for today. Moving ahead into the extended forecast, small rain chances for our Wednesday, then go ahead and get the umbrellas. You will need them for your Thursday and Friday. We could have some pretty good rain totals in the area with our numbers roughly around 80 degrees. And at this point for Saturday and Sunday and Monday, just your random summertime thunderstorms firing over the daytime heat. Some folks could get a whole lot of rainfall. Meanwhile, just down the road, absolutely nothing. So yeah. we'll see how the weekend unfolds, but I'm pretty confident Thursday and Friday will be pretty soggy for us. All right, so after how dry we've been, now we're going to be sick of the rain. It's <laughs> yeah, all but, or nothing. But make it stop. I, yeah, we just can't make up our minds here. To right. people. Well, we were talking about how crunchy our yards were. <laughs> that's true. Day, so. We need it. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's Thanks, coming. Charles. <laughs> All right, East Carolina has a great tradition in baseball. Is this the year of the Pirate? Could be as we're set to start the NCAA baseball tournament. What's going on with fans in the NBA? A Johan ran out on the court during the 76ers Wizards playoff game. The security guard with a classic form tackle. Ron Rivera was at that game. Hey, if he's looking for somebody, maybe that security guard could help out the Washington football team.
to us. Of the six baseball teams from the state of North Carolina that are in the NCAA tournament, only East Carolina will be at home. This is the eighth time the program in program history. The Pirates will be hosting a regional. ECU will face Norfolk State on Friday while Charlotte and Maryland play in the other game. Also on Friday, the Pirates, well, they feel pretty good. ECU owns an eight and four record against the rest of the 64 team field this season. So there's a lot to be excited about in Pirate Nation. And I tell our guys this, and I tell all you fans this, is, you know, some fans will look at it and go, hey, this is an easy regional. Some will say hard. Teams don't get to the postseason unless they're good. We need to worry about Norfolk State, uh, game one. Elsewhere in the NCAA, Duke will play Liberty in Knoxville, Tennessee. NC State will face Alabama first in Ruston, Louisiana, while the North Carolina Tar Heels will face UCLA down in Lubbock, Texas. The NCAA tournament starts on Friday. After two of its three games against the Mets were rained out, the Braves happy to get out of New York and back home to Atlanta to start a series with the Washington Nationals. Big first inning for the Bravos in this one. William Contreras, he's just going to hit this one to center field. Just soft enough over the infielder's head. Two runs come in to score. Braves score three in the first. Then in the second inning, that's Ronald Acuna Jr. He's at the plate. And he's going oppo taco, an opposite field home run. That is his 16th of the year. Braves go on to win this one, five to three, the final score. Mount Tabor has a very good football program. We're talking always in the mix for a conference championship and trips to the playoffs. This spring, the football season, well, it was something truly special. The Spartans won a state championship for the first time in school history. Today, the team was honored with a parade from the school that went around the nearby neighborhoods close to Mount Tabor. Call it another deposit in the memory bank. It felt amazing. We've been working for this for four years, and we just finally got the outcome that we wanted. And yeah, it feels great just to finish out on top. The school has been behind our back the whole year, our community the whole year. So like for them to come from beginning to end is just like emotional. All right, it was only one game, but the Carolina Hurricanes are now in a critical situation after losing game one of the series to the Tampa Bay Lightning. Game two tomorrow night in Raleigh. The Canes do not, I repeat, do not want to head down to Tampa, down 2 nothing in this series. The defending Stanley Cup champs are rock solid at home. The Canes, well, they have to play with a sense of urgency tomorrow. Yeah, like I said, we, we were right there yesterday. Even though we didn't play our best, we we were right there. So if we just race a level a little bit more, we we have a really good chance on winning. And like I said, tomorrow we got to focus on winning that game. Got to win the one you're in before you look too far down right. the road. But tomorrow is really a big game. Maybe they just need to get the overtime, apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. All right, thanks, Casey. All right. We'll be right back. <laughs>
aquariums can seem like a window into the undersea world. Yeah, as Fox 8's Chad Tucker tells us, some of Roy's folks say it's pretty easy to get hooked. Aquariums are very therapeutic, relaxing. They're so calming. You go home from a day at work and you just you plop down in your favorite chair and just watch the fish. The only thing that could be better is to be able to watch the fish at work. These are storm clownfish. JJ Elliott. These stars come from Sri Lanka. And Dexter Hill. And this pretty yellow one over here is called the Queen Angel and it's, uh, it's found off the Florida coast. Are the people behind Triad Reef Critter. I got my first aquarium which was a 55 gallon from my brother-in-law who was moving and uh, I set it up as a saltwater tank and a year later I Sold it and got a 150 gallon tank, and a year later I sold it and got a 300 gallon tank. And my first fish tank we laugh about was a gift. It was one of my first gifts from Dexter when we were dating, so it was very romantic. <laughs> my first rock from Dexter, we say, was uh, a rock that went in my aquarium. As you look around their store today, it's hard to believe that this all started in the basement of their home. I started doing it as a hobby, and it just evolved into a business. And business has been good. When people have to stay at home, whether it's during the winter or a pandemic, they want to do something and enjoy something beautiful in their home and a little hobby and stay active. And so the COVID-19 pandemic actually drove a lot of additional traffic for us. Just because the hobby turned into a business doesn't mean they don't still love it. In fact, during vacation, they spend even more time with sea creatures while scuba diving. But I also love our time with our customers. We've got great, a great bunch of people and most of our social life revolves around our friends who are our customers. When it comes to the aquarium business, they've definitely made a splash. In Greensboro, looking for Roy's folks, Chad Tucker, Fox 8 News. And you can find a triad of reef critters on Cessna Drive in Greensboro. That's right off Regional Road. This chicken doesn't have to cross the road. She rides on it. And she just loves it. She loves looking out the window and seeing what's going on. One of Roy's folks goes from a coupe to a sedan.
You've heard that age old question probably as early as elementary school. Why did the chicken cross the road? Well, as Chad found out, one chicken doesn't cross the road. She rides along it with one of Roy's folks. Hello, everybody. Oh, hello. Kelly Gray Merritt love spending time with her animals. These are just a few babies who live out here. From the chickens Hi, to goats. Hi. You gonna get up on your table? That's so she taught her goat Flash shake? how to shake hands. Oh, good boy. I look at them as like little joy factories. Every single one of them is just a joy delivery mechanism. <laughs> and there's just no way to be unhappy when you have animals around. Hello, my sweetheart. Hello, mama. Her menagerie is quite the contrast to the glamorous way she earns a living as a national and international travel and food writer. And her 1800s tobacco barn, converted into a cabin, serves as home base of all of her passions. The cabin is important to this mission because if I didn't have a residence here, I wouldn't be able to adopt these beautiful animals and take care of them. She's rescued and fostered all sorts of animals from horses to dogs. You know, they just all stole my heart. But none more than her constant companion, Gabrielle. She's just a highly intelligent chicken and she's just such a sweetheart. She loves being part of things. She's always the first one to come over and see what's going on. But more than anything, she likes to. You want to come go riding with mama? Leave the coop and get in the sedan. Here we go. It's me, Gabrielle. Hey, Warren, that's our neighbor. It all just kind of started one day when Kelly was about to go for a drive. I said, maybe I'll just take her with me. <laughs> so we just hopped in the car and she just loved it. Now every day, you know, she just can't wait to go for her little car ride. And she just loves it. She loves looking out the window and seeing what's going on. This is one chicken that won't ever have to worry about crossing the road. She's riding on it and delivering smiles along the way. You ready to go back in the coop? I think the reason that so many of us love animals so much is because it really is an honor to take care of them. And it does something for your heart. It makes you a better person. And they just bring so much joy. And we had a lot of fun today going for our ride. In Stokes County, looking for Roy's folks, Chad Tucker, Fox 8 News. And in case you're wondering, Gabrielle doesn't go far just for short errands or to take in a few sites. She doesn't like to travel too far from home. As a personal organizer, she helps people declutter their lives. You pick up a box of things, you say, okay, is it functional? No. Is it worth money? No. But does it mean something to you? Yes. See how one of Roy's folks discovered an old photograph that hit close to home.
attention. After buying a home and going through things left behind, one of Roy's folks found an old photograph. As Chad shows us, that picture hit pretty close to home. It's just getting started. Tiffany Hopwood makes a living as a professional organizer. You pick up a box of things, you say, okay, is it functional? No. Is it worth money? No. But does it mean something to you? Yes. And all these old cookbooks, I figured I'll donate those. She normally helps her clients figure out ways to declutter their lives. But when she recently bought this house, she put her skills to personal use. This was the first house that was built in the neighborhood, and so he was the first resident. Lawrence Boger, a Korean War veteran, built the house. He and his wife Helen lived here and raised a family. And even after Helen passed away in 2013, he continued to call it home. Everyone in the neighborhood knows Mr. Boger, and they've all stopped to say wonderful things about him. Come on. After he passed away, Tiffany became the owner of the home and some long forgotten contents, like old school annuals and other mementos Lawrence had saved. 1989 Oldsmobile Cutlass, woo! There was even a stack of the 1985 last run of the afternoon newspaper, The Sentinel. And as we were going through them to decide or pilfer through what needed to be donated and what needed to be sold and um, what was just trash, um, I came across this picture. The picture was taken May 25th, 1949, of the Signal Training Regiment at Camp Gordon, Georgia. Wow. I mean, just wow. Here I am with this picture that represents so much rich history. There are so many sons in here and husbands and brothers and there's young, young guys in here and then older men. She assumes Lawrence Boger is one of the many men in the photo. And she became even more curious about the picture when she learned Camp Gordon doesn't even exist anymore. Just in trying to familiarize myself with Camp Gordon and whatnot, watched a little YouTube video and it was based in Shambly, Georgia, which is where I grew up. Shut the front door. <laughs> and suddenly it was no longer just a photograph. It became a connection between her hometown and her new home in Winston-Salem. Looking for Roy's folks, Chad Tucker, Fox 8 News. There is another interesting note about the Camp Gordon photograph there. Chad and producer David Weatherly shot that story last Tuesday. It was May 25th, which was 72 years to the day from when that photograph was snapped. Well, thanks for watching our Roy's folks special and the Fox 8 10 o'clock news. Yeah, be sure to stick around for the Fox 8 news at 11, which is coming up next. Have a great night. Something to where the police can maybe find this killer. Who killed Ella Crawley? The 50-year-old died last May following a violent attack in Winston-Salem. A year later, her murder remains unsolved. And tonight, her family is asking the community to speak up. I spoke to them about the tough situation that is growing more stressful by the day. She didn't deserve to die the way she did. She did not deserve that. Family members of a homeless and mentally ill woman who was brutally beaten are still searching for answers a year later. Whoever done this, that they won't get any rest, that you won't be able to lay your head down at night, that you won't be able to sleep. On May 23rd, 2020, a stranger found Ella Crawley close to death near a walking path in Gateway Commons Park in Winston-Salem. She died the following day from her injuries. Why would someone become that enraged that this little this little lady that you, you could visibly see um, was not okay? Ella's sister and brother-in-law say she struggled with mental illness and had stopped taking her medication. No matter how hard they tried to get her help, 
she ended up back on the street. She was a churchgoer. I mean, she went to family reunions. She was very functionable in society until she went off her mask. She didn't have to be gone right now. This could have been prevented. Shortly after Ella's murder, officers canvassed neighborhoods close by on West Northwest Boulevard for information on the attack. Since then, police have struggled to develop leads. The longer that we're without information that's going to lead us in the right direction, this case is growing colder and we don't want it to lie dormant for any amount of time. We want to be able to continue to follow up and investigate. A cross in Flowers is still a feet from where Ella was killed. A reminder that Ella and her family deserve better. I love you and I wish I could have helped you. <laughs> I wish I could have helped you more. Winston-Salem police say getting information has been tough. They need the community's help in solving this case. So remember, you can remain anonymous through Crime Stoppers or the Text to Tip program. Reedsville police still need your help to catch the people who shot a five year old who was playing in her front yard Saturday afternoon. A dozen shots were heard by neighbors on Northwest Market Street around 240. Keith Williams, who lives near the shooting, said it sounded like rapid explosions on one end of the street. After the gunshot stopped, he heard a grandmother grandmother on the other end of the street yelling that her granddaughter had been shot in her shoulder. The young girl was taken to the hospital and is expected to be OK. Mr. Williams told Fox 8 if the shooting would have happened earlier, it could have ended even worse. Yeah, because, you know, sometimes we're sitting out here on the steps here uh, with him so he can get used to the sunlight and all. And, he, and I air, so it's, 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 it's some, you know, it makes you think. Because yeah. I done told the lady up there, which I go to store some, that, you know, one of these kids was going to get shot right here before it's over with if this if stuff didn't slack up or something happened. All right, if you saw anything that happened on Northwest Market Street, you need to contact police. Honoring a member of the Winston-Salem community, friends and family, they gathered in downtown Winston-Salem to recognize Tior Terry. Winston-Salem officers responded to calls of a man lying face down in a parking lot after being shot and found Terry dead. So tonight, friends and family, they honored him with the unveiling of a portrait. Fox 8's Daryl Matthews has a story. The painting honoring him sits right at the front door of this CVS. Earlier today, a lot of people showed their support to watch the unveiling honoring a dedicated CVS employee. A 50 by 40 canvas painting of Tior Terry now sits at the entranceway of the CVS in downtown Winston-Salem. Kim Thorne painted the mural through donations from dozens of people influenced by Tior's presence. Terry worked at the West 4th Street CVS location for several years, and family and friends say this is the perfect spot to keep his memory alive. All right, and that was Dale reporting for us in Winston-Salem. Pay attention to this because Greensboro police need your help solving a murder. Two years ago today, Stephen Anthony George was shot and killed during a home invasion on Woodmere Drive. Investigators say several people forced their way into his home and stole several things before leaving George for dead. Now they think his case is connected to other home invasions that happened in the city in 2019. If you know anything, remember you can call police anonymously and rallies against the deputy involved shooting that killed a man in Elizabeth City are set for several cities in our state, including right here in Greensboro and Winston Salem. They are set for tomorrow evening at five o'clock with the groups holding the rallies saying they want accountability following the shooting of Andrew Brown Jr. back in April. Protesters say Brown was unjustly killed while deputies tried to serve drug related warrants. The district attorney cleared the deputy saying Brown used his car as a weapon. All right, turning now to the weather and a pretty nice day out there over the Piedmont. People, plenty of you taking advantage of the Memorial Day holiday to head out to the water even after a pretty chilly Sunday. Fox 8 Max weather meteorologist Charles Ewing joins us now. And Charles, how is the rest of the week looking? 
Hey, Allison. Yeah, we are looking for a gradual warm up, replacing the awful memory of Sunday. Look at that. 89, 79, 67 on Sunday. Yes, yeah, Sunday was a very chilly day for us. And we are now going in the right direction. How about 74? That was today's high. It took a while to get there, but we finally made it up to 74 this afternoon. Now for tonight, our numbers will slowly fall back into, let's say, the low to middle 50s. That's a lot better than the 40s some people had first thing this morning. So what's ahead? Yeah, warmer Tuesday. We will be fairly close, if not going over 80 degrees, increasing humidity, and that will gradually give us better rain chances, maybe even some very good rain chances. More about that straight ahead. A somber salute marking the ultimate sacrifice. Today, the nation recognized all members of the armed services who gave their lives to protect our freedom. The Carolina Field of Honor was one of many events canceled because of the pandemic. And on its return this morning, hundreds of people came out to honor those who have served our country. Chad Tucker has a story. Here I have a flag and programs for you. Oh, great. The ultimate sacrifice is what this day is about. You can go up and do a drop off in a uh, semicircle okay. and then come back and park. A day that brought in lines of people, hundreds to remember those who never made it home. Speechless to see people still recognize what's going on. An emotional day for those like Ron Metter, who served in the Marine Corps. People ahead of me get this day to me. Every eye, every face holds a story of why they are here. 741 of us got killed before we got here. World War II veteran John Furrow is here for the 741 that he worked beside in the South Pacific, including one friend from Galax, Virginia, who died just minutes after he relieved him. It was 71 years from the time we got here till I found his family. And I found a monument on top of the mountain on the farm where he, where he was born. It's those souls, their memories, etched on hearts and in stone. Today is a day for us to remember that freedom isn't free. It cost somebody their life, and I pray that that never happens again, but unfortunately, it probably will. In Kernersville, Chad Tucker, Fox A News. And over in Winston-Salem, volunteers placed new flags in front of the graves of veterans at Happy Hill Cemetery. Happy Hill is a cemetery designated for African Americans that dates back to the 1800s. And while more than a dozen of the people buried there were former slaves, there were also entrepreneurs and veterans. The goal for cemetery coordinator Maurice Pitts Johnson is to reunite living descendants with those buried here. In the meantime, she wanted to take Memorial Day to honor veterans by placing American flags in front of their graves. Some of them were slaves, and the ones who are being recognized today are veterans who uh, fought in World War I. So that's why we have, today we have put uh, fl uh, flags at their stones. And we're trying to carry on that heritage and uh, the legacy. Happy Hill is just one of many black cemeteries in our area, and for months, Fox 8 has been digging into the stories of the forgotten souls of black cemeteries in North Carolina. So join us this Wednesday at 6 as our new series begins. And whether it's grilling out, spending time on the water, or just soaking up the sun, a people across the triad marked Memorial Day in their own way. This was the site across the triad at High Point City Lake Park. Families were out and about all day. The people took off in the water, sightseeing around the lake. Children there cooled off in the splash pads. Some people went ahead, fired up the grill to cook out hot dogs and hamburgers, a Memorial Day staple. Paul Morgan says he's relieved to be able to gather with loved ones again after this past year. I so took life for granted before last year. I'm so much more appreciative of the little things that we all took for granted. And guess what? I survived 2020, <laughs> and I am going to appreciate life big time from here on out. Good way to look at it. Okay, people told Fox A they are thankful for the sacrifice of fallen heroes making all the Memorial Day activities possible. 
Still ahead on Fox 8, a career coming full circle and a reunion decades in the making. The touching story of a doctor in Texas and how he's reconnecting with his past. And before we head to break, we want to take a moment to honor some of our graduating seniors with our senior send off. Show off your photos and say congrats to everyone. I actually saw him in the operating room for the first time um, as a student as I was getting to observe a C-section. A connection decades in the making and a career coming full circle. It is pretty uncommon for labor for a labor and delivery doctor to reconnect with a baby after they leave the hospital. But it's even more rare that they work alongside them 22 years later. Jessica Rank has a story of a special reunion at one Texas hospital. Dr. Charles Anderson is no stranger to rooms like these. I've been delivering in Abilene over 30 years. The last few he spent as an OBGYN at Hendrick Medical Center South. This is the most exciting area of medicine. There is no doubt about it. He says he gets to help bring life into the world, but it's rare that he'll see those babies after they leave the hospital. Doesn't happen very often. Next to him today is registered nurse Allison Davis. But I really love being there for the moms. She's been working under Anderson for a year now, but their relationship began way before she walked in these doors. We're all connected here. 22 years ago, Dr. Anderson was alongside Davis's mother the day Allison 
Allison was born. And I always joke and I say, well, I mean, obviously he does a good job. He delivered me. Allison studied nursing at Abilene Christian University and knew when she got to clinicals, working with the doctor who helped deliver her would be a possibility. I actually saw him in the operating room for the first time um, as a student as I was getting to observe a C-section. But it wasn't until her first day at work that the old pictures started coming out. She was like, look, this is so cool. This, you'll be able to compare, you know, how things were back then and how things are now. Anderson says this is a first for him. This is the first nurse that's, that I've worked elbow to elbow with. But he's happy he gets to be a part of not just her life, but the start of her career. He's always made me feel like family. A unique relationship between a doctor and a nurse. Like Anderson says, it's once in a lifetime. It's a good looking, although somewhat cool night across the Piedmont Triad. This is our Natty Green's camera from South Elm Street. Just check out the building back there, lit up in red, white, and blue just in time for the holiday. Outside right now, a few clouds out there, 62 degrees. Normal low for this time of the year, roughly around 61, so that's why I said sort of cool. For today, we topped out at around 74 degrees with a morning low very cool at 51 degrees. Most numbers at this point falling back into the lower 60s. Also some lower 50s up here in Rockingham County. Now for the remainder of the nighttime period, I think some clouds will develop. So by the time you hit Tuesday morning, sunny to partly cloudy skies and the clouds will become thicker during the day on our Tuesday. So we will end the day with partly cloudy skies. Now putting everything all together here, high pressure and full control for now, but it will begin to back away turning our winds into the south and that's a warmer direction. That's why I think tomorrow will be warmer than this afternoon. Also, we are tracking this warm front down here to the south. It will begin to push northbound with that warm front. Of course, you have warm air coming in behind it. Also, we have lots of muggy tropical air, lots of Atlantic moisture, lots of Gulf moisture, everything coming northbound. And as that warm front moves through during the day on a Wednesday, roughly about a 20 to a 30 percent chance for a scattered shower or thunderstorm late in the day. Then after that, this cold front will put the squeeze play on our atmosphere and rain chances will increase big time. We're talking about rain on our Thursday, also for our Friday. And for now, I'm noticing the models are trying to trend things more eastbound for our Saturday afternoon, but with so much moisture hanging in the air, also with high temperatures in the 80s, still holding out about a 40% chance for scattered showers and thunderstorms across the Piedmont Triad for our Saturday afternoon and Saturday evening. But we will continue to check the model trend to see if all this moisture will continue to shift into eastern North Carolina for Saturday. But for our overnight time period anyway, no rain to worry about, just a few clouds by morning with a low temperature going down to 54 degrees, once again below normal for this time of the year. And for tomorrow afternoon, partly cloudy skies by the afternoon with a high temperature of 80 degrees. Our extended forecast to see that small rain chance for our late day Wednesday at around 81%. Then after that, just break out the umbrellas, folks. Rain is coming our way, even some thunderstorms for Thursday and Friday. And at this point, looks like Saturday, Sunday and Monday, just your usual summertime thunderstorms we see firing up with the daytime heat as we transition into the beginning of June. By this time period with high temperatures in the middle 80s to lower 80s. Also, you see our morning lows beginning to climb. That's an indication of the humidity hanging around in the air. No more low temperatures around 50 degrees. By the latter half of our forecast period, we're talking about low temperatures in the middle 60s, maybe in some cases the upper 60s. So the heat and humidity of summer is coming, folks. So get ready. Enjoy the nice weather for now. Muggy stuff will begin late in the day on our Wednesday. All right, a big day in baseball tomorrow right here in the Piedmont. The Dash and Grasshoppers will play each other for the first time since 1968. We can thank the realignment of minor league baseball that has them in the same league this year. The High Point Rockers will play their home opener tomorrow. The Rockers now 3 and 1 after beating the York Revolution tonight. It was 11 to nothing at 1 point 13 won the final. We'll be live at both ballparks tomorrow. The Atlanta Braves with a solid performance tonight against the Nationals. The big story, Ronald Acuna. He had two hits, including his 16th home run of the season. He's now tied for the Major League League in homers with 16. The Braves win this one 
5-3 the final. Atlanta still trails the Mets by three and a half games in the NL East. Former Wesleyan star Will Myers with an eventful game. He's playing right field for the Padres. Chris Bryant hits a home run. The ball lands in the beer of a fan on the front row and Myers gets a beer bath. The hazards of big league baseball. The Padres also lost the game. 7-2. When Kyle Larson signed with Hendrick Motorsports this offseason, more than a few people in the sport predicted that he was going to have a ton of success, and we are now seeing just that. After finishing second three straight races, Larson dominated the Coke 600 at Charlotte, leading 327 of the 400 laps en route to his second victory of 2021. He's getting comfortable with his new team. And he could be just scratching the surface of success. It's going to be interesting as we go through the Honestly, I mean, all I'm thinking about the last 20 is just like, just don't be a caution because I don't want to have to be a strategy game where do we stay out, do we pit, you know, anything like that. I just kind of wanted to cruise with the checkered flag. All right, Larson jumps to second place in the playoff standings right behind Martin Truex Jr., who has three wins on the season. The next race at Sonoma. Good evening, I'm Tina Selden Cast, and it's time for tonight's lottery drawings for Memorial Day, Monday, May 31st, 2021. The Carolina pick three is our first game, first winning number eight. The second pick three is six, and our final pick three is another six. Joining me here in the studio for tonight's drawing is our auditor from Thomas and Gibbs. Now it's time for the Carolina pick four. Good luck. First winning number is six, is nine. And the second winning number, another nine. Third number one. And our final pick four tonight is five. Let's turn now to the Carolina Cash Five. If no one matches all five numbers to win the jackpot tonight, tomorrow's top prize is an estimated $152,000. Here we go. Good luck. First winning cash five tonight is nine. Second cash five, 11. Our third winning number seven. The fourth cash five is 19 and good luck our final winning cash five tonight is 40. During the past 15 years the lottery has contributed more than eight billion dollars to education and thanks for your support. Get the winning numbers right here every night and thanks for playing.
Charles, let's get one last look at the forecast and maybe we're going to stick around with that good weather. Well, yeah, I think one more day, <laughs> one more day anyway, with some very nice weather. Then after that, here comes the rain. So for tonight, still cool for this time of the year, going down to around 54 and for your Tuesday afternoon, partly cloudy and warmer with a high temperature of 80. Now for the next couple of days here, small rain chance for our Wednesday. Really, really good rain chances coming in for our Thursday and Friday. Have to keep an eye on that. Some of that rain could be heavy at times. Then by our Saturday, Sunday, Monday, just your usual renegade thunderstorms we see here during the summer popping up with the daytime heat with high temperatures climbing into the low 80s and our morning lows also beginning to climb into the middle to upper 60s. So yes. yeah, some warm stuff coming. Okay, so enjoy tomorrow. Everyone have a fabulous night and we'll see you back here tomorrow evening.